In this video, we will introduce two important signals that uh, we use a lot in signals and systems. Uh, it's the unit step function and the delta function. And we'll actually uh, uh, come to the conclusion that the delta function is extremely useful, but uh, mathematically very strange, and in fact is not really a function, but it's useful anyway. So the unit step function is pretty easy to work with. Um, we usually denote it by u of t, where this stands for unit step. Mathematically, we can write it as it's equal to 0 for values of t less than 0, and it's equal to 1 for values of t greater than or equal to 1. So if I graph this unit step function, It looks something like this. It's 0 for values of t less than 0. And then at a value of 0, it jumps up to 1. So this distance here is 1. So this is what u of t looks like. Uh, u of, uh, the unit step function is quite useful when you're doing things like uh, looking at what happens to the behavior of a motor when you turn it on, because when you turn a motor on, you flip a switch, and a voltage typically jumps from zero up to some voltage. Uh, so it also turns out that if you know the response of a system to a unit step, you can figure out the response of the system to any other input if it's linear and time invariant. So that's the unit step function. Uh, we'll use it a lot. It makes a lot of sense. The delta function is a much stranger animal. So we'll get rid of the unit step function. The delta function is um, typically denoted by this symbol, which is my rendition of a lowercase delta. Delta is a Greek letter. Um, and we can't really write out mathematically what it is, so I'll start off by giving you a conceptual idea of what it is, and then show you the one way of defining it, which is about as useful as any other way i found mathematically. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about why it's a fairly weird thing. So suppose I start off with a function that goes up at some point, stays at some value, and goes back down. So let's say it goes up at minus epsilon, goes back down at plus epsilon, and it has a height of 1 over 2 epsilon, where epsilon is some arbitrarily number, arbitrary number. Um, and uh, depending on your background in calculus, quite often epsilon is something that goes to 0, which it will do in this case. So if I look at the area of this thing, that area is uh, a side of 2 epsilon times something that's 1 over 2 epsilon. So the area of this guy is 1 unit. Okay. Now let's suppose I choose a different value of epsilon. Say we'll call this epsilon prime because it looks nice, nice and mathematically complex, epsilon prime. Now this is 1 over 2 epsilon prime. So you can see this is taller and narrower. The area of this thing is still 1. Now suppose I keep doing this. So I keep choosing um, smaller values of epsilon. So my rectangle keeps getting narrower and taller. Um, but the area, the way I'm constructing this, the area stays 1. Okay. Now suppose that I take a limit to the point where epsilon is equal to 0. Now, um, again, mathematicians cringe when we start doing stuff like this because uh, it turns out that that limit really doesn't exist. 
But the idea is I'm going to take this rectangle and I'm going to make it infinitely narrow and infinitely tall in such a way that um, the area under the rectangle stays 1. When I do that, I end up with the thing that we call a delta function. And because it's an, a, a rectangle that's infinitely, well, it doesn't, actually doesn't have to be a rectangle, it's, it's some figure that's infinitely narrow and infinitely tall, um, the way I actually represent this is badly here. I make, oh, that's just ugly. I make a big, bold arrow going up at 0. Okay, and this then would be a delta function. Actually, let me redraw that, because that is just aesthetically unacceptable. Okay, so we draw our axes. So this is t. Our delta function, we draw just, we'll make this a little fatter, is, whoops. Is just this fat arrow located at 0. Okay, so this is delta of t. Now, um, again, we'll eventually go through uh, several scenarios where uh, the delta function is quite useful. Um, depending on whether or not we derive convolution in any detail, you'll see it there. Um, turns out that uh, the uh, delta function is oftentimes also called an impulse because it's a function that's zero except where it's not and then it's really big. Uh, you can oftentimes mathematically model a uh, situation where, for example, you take a hammer and whack something really hard uh, where the uh, force that the hammer applies to an object uh, is applied over a very short period of time. Sometimes you can represent that as an impulse. And you can also um, represent uh, a, ti a linear time invariant system in terms of its impulse response. So basically the idea is you whack it with a hammer, see what it does, and uh, by measuring what it does then you can figure out what the system will do for any input. So that's quite a useful thing. The mathematical expression that you typically see used to define an impulse response is this. Uh, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of an arbitrary function f times the delta function, where we're integrating with respect to t, is just f of 0. So what this is is a very complex way of uh, getting the value of f at the point where the delta function takes off to infinity. And uh, you're, you may look at this and say, well, that's a huge amount of work to go to to be able to say that we're going to get a function and set it equal to 0, or find out what its value is at a time value of 0. But uh, it turns out that that's actually quite a useful thing to be able to do, and it motivates the uh, convolution integral, and it motivates the idea of an impulse response. It actually motivates all the useful things that the delta function does for us. So anyway, uh, that is the unit step function and the delta function.